Hi, everyone. I am uh, your host and uh, moderator, Mandeep Singh, uh, coming live from Mayo Clinic, the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine. And uh, this afternoon, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to uh, welcome my fellow colleague, friend, and mentor, Dr. Rehal, uh, who chaired our department uh, from 2010 to 18. Um, and as I say, he's uh, raised in Canada, but groomed at Mayo Clinic. Uh, for the last 20 years uh, or more, he's been here as a faculty with, with great interest in structural interventions, coronary angioplasty, um, and has been the chairman of the recently published Taylor PCI trial, has published more than 500 uh, peer-reviewed articles uh, in various reputable journals, and has keen interest in developing the uh, structural interventions even further. Uh, today, he'll talk about the genotype-directed antiplatelet therapy. Is the time right? It's a very topical uh, uh, area of interest that will ease our life into from a very generic DAPT interventions following PCI to a very precision-guided, patient-oriented approach using a very commonly available tool to genotype every patient who undergo PCI. And without further ado, uh, Dr. Rehal, uh, welcome. Dr. Singh, thank you very much for the uh, lovely and kind introduction. It's, it's been a privilege working here at Mayo Clinic with outstanding colleagues like yourself and many, many others. And I appreciate the opportunity to join all of you out there for this webinar. We're going to be talking about what Dr. Eric Topol calls smart medicine. And the question I'm going to pose to all of you is, is the time right for genotype-directed antiplatelet therapy really to come into the fore and to be incorporated in an, into our day-to-day -day practice as interventional cardiologists? Now, uh, much of the data that I'm going to present relates to our recently published Taylor PCI uh, prospective randomized control clinical trial. I, want, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the tremendous effort and work of the co-PIs, Dr. Naveen Pereira, one of our colleagues here at Mayo, and Dr. Michael Farku, a Mayo Clinic alumnus, who uh, jointly led the study. I had the honor of being the study chair to establish an international collaboration with outstanding study coordinators and site PIs the world over, and we'll uh, I'll go over that. This trial was funded both by Mayo Clinic and by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. I don't have any disclosures or conflicts of interest related to this topic. I uh, take uh, uh, no uh, money from pharmaceutical uh, companies related to the production of antiplatelet drugs. And our trial, as I mentioned, was funded internally by Mayo and by the NIH. What are the learning objectives? So at the conclusion of this program, I would hope that all of our listeners and attendees would be able to review the importance of CYP2C19 metabolism on clinical endpoints following percutaneous coronary interventions. Two, to understand the results of relevant clinical research data. A proviso here, this is a huge area with voluminous data, and I'm going to show selected trials, both prospective and observational, which I feel are relevant to the question that we asked at the beginning. And three, to describe a precision medicine approach to antiplatelet therapy following BCI. Now, what do we know about clopidogrel metabolism and clinical impact? Firstly, clopidogrel, as I'm sure almost all of you know, is a prodrug and undergoes enzymatic uh, conversion in the liver through the cytochrome P450 system, specifically the CYP2C19 enzymes, into active metabolites. The alleles that are most commonly um, that most commonly result in hypofunctioning of these enzymes are the CYP2C19 star two or star three alleles, 
And if patients are, have one copy of this allele, they're heterozygotic. If they have two copies, of course, they're homozygotic and will not uh, metabolize your clopidogrel. We know, and I'm going to show you some of these data, that if a patient has a hypofunctional allele, maybe I'll just call them loss of functional alleles from here on out, that that is associated with a higher risk of subsequent ischemic events. Accordingly, the FDA has identified a black, a black box warning for clopidogrel that clinicians, if they identify these loss of functional LDOs, should seek alternative therapies. But what is the evidence for that? Now, this is a little more detailed look at the uh, cytochrome P450 system and the CYP2C19 enzymes. As you can see, there is a dual step enzymatic conversion process into the active clopidogrel metabolite that's necessary for antiplatelet effect. There are numerous alleles that can affect the metabolism. As I've already mentioned, the STAR2 and the STAR3 are the most commonly found hypofunctional alleles or loss of functional alleles. There is a gain of function allele as well, and that's the one at the top, the STAR17. Typically, if a patient is identified with that allele, we don't need to adjust uh, clopidogrel dosing. In particular, we do not downregulate the clopidogrel dose. Now, let's look at the evidence for some of the statements that I have made. And again, I'm going to show you selected high-level data from what I feel are landmark studies. First of all, Dr. Jessica Mega and Mark Sabatine and colleagues in 2009, well over 10 years ago, published an important analysis from the Triton Timmy 38 trial examining the relationship between these polymorphisms and response to clopidogrel. Primary endpoint of CV death, MI, and stroke occurred much more commonly in carriers of loss of functional alleles in comparison to non-carriers or normal metabolizers. As you can see, 12 versus 8% of a clinically and statistically highly significant difference. Stent thrombosis was markedly different between the two, so that the risk or the rate of stent thrombosis increased from 0.8% in normal metabolizers to 2.6% in carriers of loss of functional alleles. So this is over 10 years ago. We knew that the, this, uh, the presence of loss of functional alleles is associated with increased coronary events. Dr. Michael Holmes and colleagues in JAMA 2011 published an overview, systematic review and meta-analysis of 32 studies incorporating over 42,000 patients and demonstrated a higher risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, but a lower risk of bleeding with loss of functional alleles. So a strong observational background databases that support the notion that loss of functional alleles are clinically important amongst our patients undergoing PCI. Now, despite that, let's ask what are clinicians actually using? And if we look at the data from the Optum Labs data warehouse, hundreds of millions of patients, we see that clopidogrel remains by far the most commonly prescribed antiplatelet drug, P2Y12 inhibitor, to combine with aspirin following PCI. I mean, it's, it's, it's about two-thirds of all cases, uh, even though dicagrelor has been seeing a slowly increasing utilization, while prasugrel has been seeing a slowly decreasing utilization. So clopidogrel remains the most widely prescribed P2Y12 inhibitor. Therefore, the, the issue of loss of functional alleles and their clinical impact remains highly relevant to our day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week clinical practice. Accordingly, we performed the Taylor PCI prospective randomized clinical trial, which examined the role of genotype-directed dual antiplatelet therapy versus just ordinary dual antiplatelet therapy regimens without any genotype direction on ischemic outcomes following percutaneous coronary interventions. And again, Drs. Pereira and Farku were the co-PIs 
and we had an outstanding team pulled together worldwide. And this is where the patients were enrolled from. As you can see, the United States, uh, for a change, we re-enrolled more patients than any other country in this trial, but closely followed by our colleagues in South Korea, where the trial was headed by a couple of our Mayo Clinic alumni and graduates. And this is important because East Asian populations do have a higher prevalence of loss of functional alleles. Canada enrolled over 1,100 patients, and Mexico also helped out with almost 100 patients enrolled in the study. The primary endpoint was a composite, clinically relevant endpoint, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, stent thrombosis, or hospitalization for severe recurrent ischemia within one year after index BCI. I should point out the primary endpoint is time to first event, time to the first event. Secondary endpoints included major and minor TIMI bleeding, and, and we looked at endpoint rates at one, six, and 12 months. So here are the data. Primary endpoint is shown in the zoomed in panel. One can see that patients treated without any genotype guidance had a higher rate of their primary endpoint, whereas those that were treated with genotype guidance had a lower rate of endpoints. The adjusted hazard ratio was 0.66, but you will note carefully the 95% confidence intervals at this rate for this power did barely cross the line of identity, 1.00. Therefore, the p-value came in at 0.056. So almost highly significant, but not quite. The number needed to treat, if we accept that there is a real difference, would be 55 to prevent one endpoint. And again, I want to draw your attention to the fact that this is time to the first event. Let's look now at the time breakdown at three and 12 months. One can see that the hazard is different according to quarters. So in the first three months following PCI, there was a marked benefit to using genotype-directed guidance for dual antiplatelet therapy. In fact, the hazard ratio fell by almost 80% down to 0.21. Thereafter, if you look, if one looks closely at the slope of the red and blue lines, one can understand that the risk is fairly similar for both of these strategies after 90 days. Therefore, in the highest risk period, the first one, two, and three months following PCI, this is where genotype guidance really showed that it made a clinical impact. Secondly, from the patient's perspective, let's look at the cumulative incidence of MACE at one year. So if you're the patient and you have an event, you're still at risk of having future events. So if we look at the cumulative incidence of MACE at one year, and this was a pre-specified analysis, we didn't make this up afterwards, the genotype-directed arm had a hazard ratio that was only 0.6 com comparison to those uh, patients not treated with genotype direction. And this was highly significant at a p-value of 0.011. This paper is currently being worked on and will be hopefully published in the next few months but I think this better sets the results of the tailored PCI into a perspective that aligns not only with the patients, but with our clinical perspective as well. These are not the only data out there. So uh, my colleagues, Dr. Prera, uh, Ryan Lennon, and many others are collaborators from the Taylor PCI trial subsequently performed with the assistance of Dr. Hassan Murad a meta-analysis of seven prospective randomized trials and four observational studies, which showed, and this is a really important point, which showed that all the benefit of Ticagrelor or Prasugrel in preventing ischemic events is amongst loss of function allele carriers. Here are the data. When one looks at the, the, the uh, risk of ischemic events, this is loss of function. These are the trials and studies that were included. And one can see that the risk of an ischemic event is 
7%, so this is in patients uh, treated with uh, ticagrelor or prasugrel in comparison to clopidogrel at 10.3%. So this is patients in whom the clopidogrel metabolism is impaired. They definitely derive a benefit from ticagrelor or prasugrel, clearly shown. But let's look at the wild type. These are in patients that don't have loss of function alleles, and there, the risk is almost identical, 8.8 .8 versus 9.2%. So what we infer and conclude from these data is that, again, all the benefit of the more powerful P2Y12 inhibitors, ticagrelor and prasugrel, is restricted to loss of function allele carriers in whom clopidogrel metabolism is impaired, a very important observation. So what this sets up, of course, is a potential therapeutic pathway for us clinicians to follow that's based on pharmacogenetic testing for oral P2Y12 inhibitors. So in other words, what we could do based on these data is do a PCI, do genetic testing, and then follow the patient accordingly. If they have loss of functional all alleles, we treat them with the more powerful P2Y12 inhibitors. If they don't, we then treat them with clopidogrel. And these are the data that I have shown you. Now, this is another very important meta-analysis performed by Dr. Galli, Angelilo Pereira, and numerous colleagues from around the country and the world. And this, this was looking at the effects of guided, whether it's genotype or phenotype guidance, and, and comparing the potent P2Y12 inhibitors versus clopidogrel. This was a network meta-analysis which allows us to compare different treatments in different studies, even if they haven't been directly compared in those trials. Importantly, this analysis included over 61,000 patients from 15 randomized trials. And here are the findings. One, the guided strategy, either genotype or platelet phenotype, was tested against the other P2Y12 inhibitor strategies. And this was the only strategy that significantly reduced the risk of MACE, of major adverse cardiac events. And this was clinically and statistically significant without an increase in bleeding risk. So now, Dr. Singh is going to ask, what do we do? What do we do with all of these data? Well, I think one valid question is why not just use ticagrelor or potentially prasugrel in all patients? Why do we have to worry about this? Well, I, I would respectfully point out if we look closely and critically at the evidence base in, in some of the prospective trials, in the PLATO trial, less than 10% of patients were enrolled in North America. And in that cohort, their risk of death was actually higher, not lower. So there, I'm not going to get into a debate about this. This has been extensively debated, but the observation is the observation. Second, affordability. Over $1,000 for a 90-day supply of ticagrelor versus $16 for clopidogrel. If you're paying for this, what would you prefer? If your insurance company is paying for this and you're paying insurance premiums, what would you prefer? Third, adherence. The rates of premature discontinuation of ticagrelor are over twice as high as the rates of premature discontinuation of clopidogrel. Again, leading us to believe either there are metabolic or clinical side effects occurring, or we're just not as fastidious with careful follow-up. There are other studies that actually really do uh, uh, impact and, and are directly relevant, including popular genetics that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. This was a study of primary patients undergoing primary PCI for STEMI, and the default therapy was ticagrelor or prasugrel, the more potent P2Y12 inhibitors. The patients subsequently had genotype uh, performed, and those that had normal clopidogrel metabolism were de-escalated down to clopidogrel. And of course, what they showed, I'm sure you all know this, is that the genotype-directed approach was non-inferior, no worse, and with less bleeding. So the investigators concluded, and I concur with this, that this approach allows for safe de-escalation of antiplatelet therapy. So on the one hand, we can escalate 
to a more potent P2Y12 inhibitor should patients have loss of functional alleles. And on the other hand, we can de-escalate after starting dicagrelor or prasugrel down to clopidogrel. I shouldn't say down, but convert over to clopidogrel should they be normal metabolizers. Now, we know that genotype, as I've been talking about, is an important determinant of outcomes and coronary disease, especially following PCI, but it's not the only determinant. Otherwise, it would have already been used and be much more powerful than what I've shown you. So there are genotype environment interactions that are critically important. And uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Dominic Angelillo and his colleagues, as you see here, published, I think, a very important paper in 2020 called the ABCD gene study, which looked at a prospective score that combines these clinical parameters, age, BMI, chronic kidney disease, diabetes mellitus, and the genotype into the aptly named ABCD gene score, and they looked at high platelet reactivity. So here are the integer points, and again, Dr. Singh is an expert on if developing scores and integer points. If one looks at, at these clinical risk factors, one can assign a score. Like for example, if a patient's over 75, we'll give them a score of four, et cetera, so on and so forth. But look at this. If there are two loss of functional alleles, the integer points that are assigned are 24. So what the investigators found is that a score greater than 10 identifies high platelet reactivity and is subsequently associated with one-year clinical outcomes. I won't go through these data in great detail, but I would encourage those of you that are interested to read the ABCD gene study. So a pragmatic approach, what I think is a smart pragmatic approach would be after PCI to do, if it's available, a point of care genotype test. We were fortunate in the Taylor PCI to have available a platform that was easy to use with a buccal swab and results were available within an hour or so and gave us very accurate readings that we subsequently confirmed with the uh, gold standard laboratory-based TACMAN assays. So these point-of-care assays are fantastic. For patients who are found to have loss of function alleles, it's very appropriate for them to be escalated to the more potent P2Y12 inhibitors, Ticraglor and Presopril. For patients that do not have loss of functional alleles, in other words, they have normal clopidogrel metabolism, this should be about 70% of the population, it's very safe and appropriate to treat them with clopidogrel. The beauty of this approach is that it maximizes safety and efficacy and minimizes cost. In other words, it provides the highest value for our patients and our healthcare system simultaneously. So how come we're not doing this? So what do we need next? I'd say that we need more innovation and investment by industry and in point of care testing, and this is coming. Second, we need continued research into ultra short DAPT regimens informed by genotype. Maybe three months is enough. What about one month? And third, I think the, the national guidelines need to incorporate these up-to-date data and modify their recommendations accordingly. So again, finally, I would like to acknowledge my co-investigators in the Taylor PCI trial and our study coordinators, and I would like to acknowledge the support we received from the Mayo Clinic, NHLBI, and Spartan Biosciences who made the point of care assay. So I think with that, we'll stop, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chet. This was uh, the most wonderful talk I've ever, ever heard about the utility of uh, genotyping in precision medicine in amongst patients who uh, undergo PCI. So far, the guidelines have argued against routine escalation of therapy using this approach or even routine de-escalation of therapy. Uh, 
what do you think are the possible reasons? Did we choose the wrong targets? Uh, did we choose the wrong test? Um, did we choose the wrong set of patients, like low risk or not a very high risk patient, or or did we, or were we too ambitious in our in our goals in terms of the benefit that we will achieve with genotyping? What do you think uh, happened, and where do you think the science is going to happen? in the next few years as we tread towards precision medicine? So, and if it's a good question, I think we need to parse out the scientific data from the guideline development process. To answer your question about the guidelines, I think you should direct that to the people who write the guidelines. This is a complex process. There's multiple factors involved. And as I pointed out, a lot of the data supporting a point of care uh, assay-based uh, approach or even a lab-based approach are very recent and have not yet been incorporated into the guidelines. And um, I think we're up against the forces of the status quo. People are very comfortable doing something a certain way. If they don't have personal experience with it, they're less likely to sign off if they're a member of a guideline writing committee. So, you know, guidelines, I think are valuable to the extent that they are based on high quality data. Okay, Rob Califf and others have shown repeatedly that only 10 to 15% of guideline-based recommendations are based on high quality clinical data, i.e. those derived from prospective randomized clinical trials. This is not to, not to downplay the importance of the other recommendations, but remember those then become expert-based recommendations and whether or not those experts are comfortable with this approach is a separate question. So I want to parse out the guideline development issues from the scientific data. And again, as I've shown you, the scientific data are being developed and being developed quickly. So in my opinion, for what it's worth, I think we have more than adequate data demonstrating that uh, a precision medicine approach using a point of care assay following PCI can effectively stratify patients into those that can very, very safely have dual antiplatelet therapy with clopidogrel plus low dose aspirin versus those that need a more potent P2Y12 inhibitor. And Deep, as you're well aware, many other questions are arising, and I alluded to this as what about monotherapy? Yeah. Gosh, if you're going to use monotherapy and you're going to give clopidogrel, you better make sure it works, right? And um, so what about ultra short regimens? All of these are actually opportunities for the cardiology community, the interventional community specifically, to develop more relevant clinical data that can inform practice and ultimately inform the guidelines. Yeah, that, that's, that's an excellent point. Dr. Strauss um, has uh, uh, asked uh, the question on if you can elaborate on increase in mortality you referred to with ticagrelor a bit further, she's a little perplexed that nobody talks about it in any fora. And you are, I mean, from, from her perspective, you are the first one who's brought it up. Um, can you uh, further or elucidate the possible mechanisms of higher mortality with ticagrelor? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. You're right, no one talks about this. I'm really not sure why. The, the data uh, are in uh, table two of the supplementary appendix. So number one, how many people go ever read a supplementary appendix? Um, but it's in there. And the hazard ratio is 1.20. So I, I don't know about the mechanisms. It could just be play of chance, right? I mean, this is a sub-study of a but again, less than 10% of patients were enrolled in North America versus those enrolled in the rest of the world. It could be that there are qualitative differences between patients in North America versus um, you know, Eastern Europe, Middle East, India, et cetera. It could be that we treat them differently than they, than they treat them there. So it could be that the interplay between risks and benefits is different. So Excellent. it's just an observation, but it's, it's there. So let me ask you um, something, which as I, I've been reading more about the uh, genotyping is what do you think is the role, if there is any, complementing the results of genotyping with platelet function studies, which certainly can be oft repeated. Um, we certainly can find whether the platelet reactivity is still high on treatment even though 
the early decision point of choosing clopidogrel versus higher intensity P to Y12 inhibitors on, on genotype assay divides these patients into two groups. But certainly, can we add value if we add platelet function testing to genotyping? That's a great question um, and, and one that there's no answer to yet. We do know that um, a platelet function testing is problematic and highly variable, right? So it's not a reproducible test. I mean, even the ACTs we use in the cath lab, for example, are plus or minus, right? I mean, but platelet function test, platelet reactivity testing is really plus or minus. Mm -hmm. Numerous things can affect platelet reactivity and platelet function testing. Even the technique of withdrawing the blood can affect it. So uh, unfortunately, the trials that have looked at uh, platelet phenotype guided outcomes have really not, um, you know, have really not been positive or more or less been negative. But this is the beauty of doing the genotype. The genotype is the genotype. It's not going to change from a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis, right? Yeah. So yeah. Whether, whether or not we can develop better platelet function assays that we can combine with genotype testing is an open question. And I think that it's a very exciting question, actually. Yeah, yeah. How about the epigenetics? Um, for example, have you, your group or somebody else has looked at the uh, epigenetic modifications of, for example, drug absorption kinetics, drug-to-drug um, -drug interactions uh, that can influence uh, the results of the uh, CYP2C19 genotyping? Yeah, that's a good question, Amandeep. I don't know the answer to that, actually. Okay. So, but I think these are the type of questions that our, our pharmacology colleagues, you know, really can help us answer so that those of us on the clinical side can then, you know, potentially apply them to our patients. So which test uh, people are asking would you recommend doing it? Is it a point of care assay? Do you send blood? And what's the turnaround time? Yeah, it's a good question. So, Right now, um, the point of care assay that we're using, which by the way is a very cost-effective, inexpensive assay, is not on the market because the, the manufacturer, like many companies did, had problems during the pandemic. And um, now the good news is that technology has been rescued by another company and hopefully will soon be coming back on the market. But you know, one company producing one technology is not enough. As I mentioned in my what's next slide, we do need industry to really step up to the plate here. And we need multiple platforms that could be um, deployed in cath labs. So the ideal situation would be an easy to use black box where your technician or nurse or you take a, take a swab, buckle swab, put it in a tube, plug it into the black box and you get a reading within an hour. That's the ideal situation. This doesn't exist yet. Most hospitals, who have this treatment use what's called a TACMAN assay. I'm not an expert in these assays, but these are have to be done in a CLIA lab uh, that's supervised by uh, you know, lab uh, a specialists who know how to run these assays. So the yeah. turnaround time varies. It can be anywhere from one day to five days, depending on your hospital. So the situation is such that if you only have the CLIA lab-based approach, I, I then tend to reserve it for patients at the highest risk for future cardiovascular events, right? You've got a big STEMI, proximal LED, left main STEMI, et cetera. Uh, you really need to know whether or not your drug is working. And um, so that's an ideal situation, I think, to do that. If you've started them on a potent P2Y12 inhibitor, you can de-escalate them a few days later, right? Um, uh, so um, that's, that's what I would say right now. I think that's a that's a very important point, uh, a take home message that one, because we use clopidogrel in about two thirds of all our PCI patients as a component of DAPT, and with the variability that is inherent with the CYP2C19 uh, metabolism of this drug, and we can't replace that with indiscriminate use of ticagrelor, or for example, with the cost and other implications. It makes perfect sense to me to routinely test and assess the genotyping of this patient, especially in the higher risk subsets. Uh, 
still we move to the lower risk ACS and even a stable uh, ischemic heart disease population, I don't see any downside uh, to knowing my genotyping uh, uh, status uh, at the time when I undergo a PCI because it will benefit me both ways. Uh, it will lower my ischemic risk and it will definitely lower my bleeding risk. Now, um, and it is very relevant uh, as against the uh, platelet function studies that we do it at, at, at the time when we do the PCI um, because you very elegantly showed that the maximum hazard is in the first few weeks or first few months of PCI. And then it levels off, but the bleeding risk continues. So if I know my, my, the status of my genes at the time when you do my PCI, I think I'll, I, I benefit both ways. Do you, do you agree with the statement or do you have uh, uh, anything else to add? I, I think you worded it extremely well. Uh, the ischemic risk sort of levels out after 90 days between the two groups. The hazard is the same, um, but the bleeding risk continues. And the longer you have patients on potent drugs, the more likely they are to bleed. So I, I, I think I really like how you have worded this. And it's really that first 90 days, that's the highest risk period. So yeah, I, I completely agree. And then the, the other issue is that the ischemic risk and the bleeding risk overlap. You know, so uh, even though there is a time dependent uh, correlation between ischemic hazard and PCI, that time dependent hazard, even though very well present with the bleeding risk as well, but it, it just continues a little longer than ischemic risk. That brings me to the point of, of this DAPT duration and even all-cause mortality, even with clopidogrel and Plavix seen in the DAPT trial, um, similar to what you alluded to with or So prolonging the duration of DAPT, I, I think, doesn't serve our patients well. I think we have to be extremely careful. All, you know, we're, we're dealing with high-risk patients, many of them middle-aged or older, have multiple comorbidities. And if they have, uh, you know, a, a femoral bleed or a retroperitoneal bleed or a GI bleed, and clinicians are forced to stop their antiplatelet therapy, they then in turn, as you and others have shown, are at risk of ischemic events. So this could be one mechanism of, you know, what, what, what they observed in the PLATO trial. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not at all clear that longer is better for antiplatelet therapy, for dual antiplatelet therapy, even if patients are at high risk for future cardiovascular events. So, so in other words, most patients with coronary disease will eventually die of coronary disease, right? Um, but that doesn't mean we should treat them with dual antiplatelet therapy forever. Now, yeah. could, we, could we identify secondary prevention patients that have normal clopidogrel metabolism and maybe replace the aspirin, right? I mean, you know, the aspirin likely is causing a lot of the gastritis, gastrointestinal hemorrhages through its systemic effects as opposed to clopidogrel. So there's mm -hmm. lots of opportunities, I think, for us to, to learn, uh, to investigate and learn, come up with better regimens that are safer for our patients. Yeah, I think the aspirin-free strategies um, bode well, especially amongst the population with high bleeding risk. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this, that um, how about do you think uh, the next step would be, do you think this genotype-based approach can be used amongst patients on anticoagulants as well? Uh, we know uh, similar liver modification, at least on patients on warfarin. Um, do you think similar approaches can be used uh, in these patients, which are now contributing to a significant minority of patients undergoing PCI? Yes, yeah, so if I understand your question, you're asking about um, uh, warfarin and other anticoagulants in, in patients with coronary disease. Well, well, the answer is yes, of course. Uh, warfarin is also, the metabolism of warfarin and the therapeutic effect is also genomically regulated, which is why we sometimes see patients that need very high doses of 10, 12 milligrams a day to achieve a therapeutic effect. And so I, I think it is theoretically possible, even though it has not been investigated thoroughly, 
that a pharmacogenomically guided approach to anticoagulation, i.e. antithrombin therapy, could also you know, be a benefit. I mean, can, can you foresee a day when there's a panel of tests that are done from one buccal smear, right? And, and we come up with the best antithrombin drug for the patient and the best antiplatelet drug that maximizes safety and efficacy. And you know, as you alluded to before, the safety as aspect cannot be overemphasized because patients and clinicians only see the, um, you see the bleeding and the negative effects, right? If you prevent an MI, you never know. If you're the patient, right? If you're the interventional cardiologist, how many times do we go home and say, gosh, I prevented an MI today? We treat MIs, we cause bleeding, but this is the paradox of prevention, is that we have to be extremely careful with, with the negative side because one bleeding episode and all of a sudden patients will stop their medications because they're afraid yeah. of another one and they never and, get the benefit. That's why I asked you about the warfarin and the DOAC issue because those are the patients who definitely will be on one P2Y12, if not in addition an aspirin. Yeah. Um, and these are the patients who are more most likely to bleed uh, from the triple regimen. Well, I, I tell you, and you know my, my opinion of this, I have always thought triple therapy is dangerous and and uh, we have all seen patients who have had life-threatening hemorrhages. And unfortunately, we've seen patients who've lost their life due to hemorrhages, you know, intracranial, retrocranial, et cetera, from triple therapy. We need to be extremely judicious and think very, very critically and carefully as to why we're prescribing triple therapy, right? So if they have atrial fibrillation, I mean, what is their risk of systemic embolism over the next month, for example, right? Does it really justify exposing them to triple therapy? Very important, yeah. So now, Dr. Rehal, do you have a different approach uh, for patients in whom you've done the genotype testing and they are homozygotes versus heterozygotes for loss of functional allele for CYP219? In well, other words, well, can I switch them back to clopidogrel if they are heterozygotes or, or not? Answer is no. So if they're homozygotic, of course, nothing's working. If, mm -hmm. if they're heterozygotic, it's only partially working. Neither are adequate. They need to have normal clopidogrel metabolism to continue on clopidogrel. So don't, don't get the theoretic differences between heterozygosity and homozygosity mixed up in terms of a clinical event. They need to have normal clopidogrel metabolism, uh, in my opinion. Very important, very important point for the audience that um, it is the metabolization of the clopidogrel which has to be above intermediate uh, for them to continue on clopidogrel. Anything less um, than intermediate metabolization of clopidogrel um, asks for a switch to or escalate them to either ticagrel or, or presogrel. One more question I have um, is uh, the role of artificial intelligence, uh, as, as we see, it's everywhere. Um, do you see uh, your field moving towards some uh, complementary role of AI in, in, in this field? Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great question and a fruitful area for research. You know, ideally, what I would love to see, Mandeep, to answer your question, we have voluminous data in our electronic medical records, right? Mm -hmm. voluminous data, mm -hmm. all sorts yeah. of data, impossible for a single clinician to sort through all of it. So mm -hmm. what would be really helpful is to have a digital assistant, right? With artificial intelligence that gathers these data, integrates them and predicts who's going to bleed or who's going to have an ischemic event with a, you know, with a good degree of, of uh, not certainty, but you know, some reasonable a AUC so that the AI can then inform the RI, right? The real human intelligence that has to go into this. And uh, so we do need digital assistance like that. And I think that, that really could be an important practice enhancement. Currently, it's chaos when you try to go into the EMR, try to pull out all relevant, do they have cancer, right? I mean, have they bled before, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Pulling out all of these important uh, risk factors is not always easy. Yeah, yeah. I think the the field is moving and should move towards uh, 
um, simultaneous transcription of your dictation towards risk calculation so that by the time you are done with your dictation for the patient, on the left of the screen, you should have all the risks that that can, patient can have and the odds of having it based on what procedure you want to do. Yeah, I, th um, I think that's really true. And, and I think the other thing that's potentially very powerful about an informatics AI-based approach is the ability to incorporate hundreds, if not thousands of variables, right? So if you look at the ABCD, ABCD gene score, right? Four clinical mm -hmm. variables, one genomic variable. But there are hundreds of variables in, in these medical records. And you know, perhaps we could develop um, algorithms and models that have an AUC of 0.9 as opposed mm -hmm. to 0.7 if we mm -hmm. were able to incorporate many, many more very important variables. Yeah, yeah. I think the inertia all of us have, including myself, um, is to toggle into the, to, to the web page and try to calculate the risk myself manually. Um, and that is a chore by itself to find so many risk calculators and trying to find the right one that will suit the patient. But you're right, I mean, if we use uh, the uh, natural language processing, for example, or web-based automatic transcription of your dictation into a risk calculation, I think will obviate the need for manual calculation of these risks. Yeah, you know, manual calculation is something from the past. We, we yeah. should not and, and, and be doing this anymore, right? We, we need to really be looking towards a future where digital assistants do this stuff for us and do it with a better and higher degree of accuracy than we can. Totally agree, totally agree. Any last minute thoughts? Uh, we are about five, seven minutes early. No, I, I, I hope this was uh, informative for, for your audience. I, I thank you all for listening and thank you, Mandeep, as always, for an engaging conversation. All right. You take care, Dr. Rihal. It was such a pleasure and honor to have you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. So